Welcome to Gate Crashers, a podcast dedicated to kicking open the door to your next favorite thing. Our mission, our creed, and our code is this, to make all things more approachable and accessible to everyone. We want you to find a universe that you'll fall in love with. Hi, I'm Dan. My pronouns are he, him. And I am very lucky to be joined by two members of the creative team of the upcoming Catwoman series at DC. I'm joined by the writer of Excalibur, X Corp, Vampire the Masquerade, The Anarch Tales, and soon-to-be Knights of X, Tini Howard. Hi! And artist of Miss Marvel, Hulk, Power Pack, and so many other beautiful titles, Nico Leone. Hello. Got it in one go. How's everyone doing? Great. Great. Thank you for having us. Yeah. I'm very excited to have you both on. I've been very excited for this book. I just got to reread it again today. Um, it's it's such an exciting book, so I'm very excited to get to talk about it. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yeah, we, we are just now starting to hear people's thoughts on it trickle in because it comes out next week. And it's really exciting. People have been yeah, so really exciting. into it so far. And I'm really like Nico and I are like stupid in love with it. Like we, <laughs> we love our books. So. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> some of the questions that I've got are like, I tried so hard to sound elegant about them, but like some of the things are just like, I really just want to know this for me. Um, but before we get to all the fun stuff, I don't know how much you know about gate crashers, but we're actually known as like pretty hard hitting journalists and like, People know we're very serious about this kind of stuff. So we always like to open with a pretty tough question. And here it is. What's your favorite sandwich? Um, you know, this is actually a great question to ask on topic because in the first uh, issue of Catwoman, um, you know, Selena uh, eats because women eat. And um, I wanted to have her just like chowing down on a sandwich. And in my mind, it was very clearly like a classic Italian sub, like, you know, like, you know, some meats, some cheese, like, you know, the, like the mozzarella and the prosciutto and all of it, like the salami, all the ham, little tomato, little basil, a little vinegar. And I went and got myself one of those sandwiches from one of the Italian places in LA because I was like <laughs> raving it after I wrote it. And after Nico <laughs> like chowing down, I was like, I need an Italian sandwich. And now I'm like, and for some reason, I've just been in this huge phase where I just want to eat Italian sandwiches all the time. So that's my favorite sandwich. Uh, but on my end, my favorite sandwich is maybe, I don't know if you have ever tried it because it's a very Argentinian thing, actually. It's, we call it sandwich de milanesa. Milanesa will be like a beef, but fry it with bread. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. a thing uh, mm -hmm. over the world. Yeah. It's so tasty. Even if you just throw that in a slice of tomato, it, it, it's the worst. So awesome. if you have any Argentinian restaurant close, make sure to go and get a sandwich of Milanesa. It will change your life. What if when it's safe, I just come down and eat one with you <laughs> in Argentina? Yeah, it's... <laughs> That's it's very interesting to me when people tell me sandwiches I've never heard of before because then I have to try them. Um, and I'm glad you brought up the sandwich thing and the issue because like, I thought I was going to be the only one super excited about that. Like when I saw that, I was like, yes, I love when I see characters get to eat sandwiches. <laughs> it just, I, I think uh, about, you know, I, I, I think a lot about those kind of uh, details and Nico does too. It's like one of my favorite things about working with him is like, he'll think about things like, you know, what a character's phone lock screen looks like and stuff like that. And yeah, to me, it's like always a specific, it's like, I, I had to get in that moment where it's like, when I'm, when I'm walking in, like an empty, you know, my apartment or like a hotel room if I'm traveling and I come in and I'm exhausted with like my bag of groceries and my luggage, like what do I want usually? And it's like, I want to stand at the counter and eat something with my hands that like, I don't have to think about. And I can just like shove it all in my mouth at once while I like deprogram from my day. <laughs> <laughs> so with Catwoman, Selena is a thief, a hunter, and she's sort of like an apex predator. She's pretty much smarter than all the other villains in the room at any given time. Now, sometimes she steals to help others, and other times she steals just for the thrill of it. What do you think drives her in your works? Hmm. Um, for me, um, it's that she's 
uh, a defender of those who may not always look like the kind of people that get justice. Um, she sees what other people don't. Um, she's a woman. She looks out for women um, and other people who are uh, marginalized and suffering and victimized. Um, to me, she's very much the kind of person who doesn't want uh people to like undergo the things that she's undergone and the things that she's seen. Um, I think probably the most important thing about her to me is that um, I'm a superhero fan, a superhero comic fan, but um, I often like the like morally complicated characters, the characters who are sometimes like, you know, choosing to do the bad thing or choosing to do the thing that they want to do or, or, maybe the thing that's the right thing, but isn't always the pretty thing. Um, and I think there are not a ton of female characters that just, especially in like Western superhero comics that um, get to be like that kind of complicated. And Catwoman is, and it's always, she's always been that, like Selena's always been that character. And she's like kind of the holy grail of female characters to me when it comes to this kind of complex women who are like you know the best they are at what they do and what they do isn't very nice <laughs> um but she's also like just a, a good person through and through who like you trust so much her sense of morality and her compass there um but she is also like our take on her is really inspired like one thing nico and i both really like is manga and uh i really really love in manga how they have you know jose manga which is manga for grown women (laughs) like comic books for adult complicated women um and the characters in them are often you know adult complicated women and and like jess likes manga too and it's something that nico and jess and i have all been like yeah um there are a lot of great comics that have a great approach to complicated women and i'm trying to bring in a lot of that inspiration to our take on selena that's a great answer um, so many artists and writers create playlists for their work so they can listen to them while they work. If you had to describe the soundtrack for your Catwoman, what kind of songs would be on it? Nico, do you do you listen to music mm-hmm. when you draw? Yeah, I all the time. It, but for me, it really depends on the scene mm-hmm. and for the different stage of the process of the when I'm drawing. For example, if I'm doing layouts, I go with movie music like action action soundtracks for movies which i really don't recommend to do because (laughs) what what you're listening is super cool but then when you get to see that movie again in my case i start to hear the same like the music and i i start to focus on the music and lost the scene so it it really ruined a couple of movies for me (laughs) but but (laughs) But well, now that I have all of those in my playlist, I just keep hearing them, and that makes me very happy. That for Catwoman, lately I have been hearing a lot of the League of Legends soundtrack, especially uh, uh, "Get Chinks." I love that song. And which other songs? It was uh, I don't remember. But all that playlist, because I have been wor- watching the, the series Arcane, mm-hmm. and that also gave me a lot of inspiration to draw. And yeah, it's very cool, because all that songs is make you feel so powerful. All the lyrics, is, I really recommend. I love that energy. Yeah, I, uh, I'm a big music person when I write. Um, a lot of people know I'm good friends with Fida Ayala and Leah Williams. And the three of us, like, will, in like, if we have deadlines and we know that we're, like, busy and crunching, we'll be like, hey, do you need music? Like, Because <laughs> um, we know that it, like, powers us all. And sometimes it's, like, it's fun to have a friend play, like, DJ and be like, like, the three of us are always like, hey, this song might work for your thing. Like, <laughs> like this song was stuck in my head and it made me think about your book. But uh, I do have a Catwoman playlist. Um, I think I'll probably, I'll probably post it on my sub stack on Tuesday for folks who want to uh look at it while they read along but i mean it's it's a lot of music that um well one it's a lot of stuff that represents gotham city to me right like i've been a a gotham fan for a lot of my life and um i'm a 
goth girl. <laughs> I like um, I like darkness. I like tension. I like a lot of the elements that are just so part of Catwoman and so part of Gotham. So it's like not hard for me. Like, I mean, there are songs that have made me think about Catwoman since before I ever knew I was going to be a comic book writer. Like, of course, I'm going to put, you know, like Black Cat by Janet Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> there, of course, um, I'm gonna put a little like nine snails, you know. Um, but then there's also like Eartha Kit on there, and there's um, some of the Neon Demon soundtrack, and there's uh, a French cover of a Dead Kennedy song, <laughs> and uh, uh, some Shakira, and it's just it's it's a, a really love and rockets. I like all sorts of music. Um, but yeah, it is really clear to me. Like I know intimately. Like the songs on my playlist, I think would look really like, okay, there's some themes here, but not like a clear one. But then like, but to me, like I could, I could tell you, like there are songs on there where it's like, oh, that's for like something that hasn't even shown up yet. It's just like, I know I want to use, I know I want to listen to it while I write a fight scene in the future. Um, I would say if I had to like pick a few like real favorite, um, like Catwoman songs lately, um, there's a Lovage song called To Catch a Thief that's really good. And it's all about like, like literally the lyrics are like, you know, talking about chasing your lover across a rooftop dressed in black. And I'm like, that's Gotham City, baby. Like, Perfect. yeah. Um, there's a lot of Janet Jackson on this playlist. I really love Janet Jackson. Ah, uh, I'll, I'll make it, I'll post it at some point so you guys can enjoy it. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely a music person. And for me, like, there's a lot of energy in Catwoman that's, um, a lot of the songs on it are like what I would think of as like movie music for it. But then there are also a lot of songs that are just things I imagine that like, you know, Selena would listen to on repeat if she was having a bad day or if she was punching at the gym or if she was going on a run or if she was getting ready for a party. Like there's just music that I think would make her feel empowered. And so I listen to them when I write her and it helps me empower her. It's like the vibes of the music is what you want to imbue in the actual yeah. thing. Yeah, like what would she put on? Like I like to put on music while I get my while I put my makeup on and get ready to go out. And often the music I put on matches the vibe for when I'm getting ready. And Selena, I think, would do the same thing. I love it. Now, what themes would you say are the core of the stories that you're looking to explore in Gotham? Um, I like to tell stories about women, but stories that are universal. I think that's really, really powerful. Uh, I'm a huge horror movie fan. That's a huge horror thing. Um, horror is infamous for things like Rosemary's Baby, which are stories about like, it's a story about an incredibly, you know, that's a, that's a very ex- womanly experience, very female experience for a lot of people. Um, but everyone, lots of people love that movie. Plenty of, mm-hmm. of men find that movie very, very scary. Um, even though it's something that they, you know, will likely... Um, you know, they're a cis man, never experienced. Yeah. Um, uh, and I think that's a, that's so inspiring to me. Um, I mean, I think of any, any story where you can get behind the woman because you trust what she does in her job and go along for the ride. I just think that's such a powerful thing to do with a character. I think it's why Batman is so successful. Um, because you, you trust that if you're, reading a batman story you're in the passenger seat you're robin you're there with him you're not going to get your butt kicked like you're with the smartest guy in the room um and i want catwoman readers to know that they're with the smartest woman in the room the smartest person in the room she happens to be a woman um but her story that i'm working with in a lot of ways is, is deeply about the specific kind of journey um she hasn't got them being a woman for better and for worse what about you nico i've talked a lot (laughs) no yeah i think i it makes me think like about the journey she's doing like trying i i feel somehow she's trying to like find her place again like in because she has been away from Gotham, and now when she's coming back she's looking for this place to um i don't know like it's, it's a journey like a self-discovering mm-hmm. journey which also always is like the best kind type of story for me you have like the self-discovery journey plus some love story and you have the best story ever yeah i think um 
Thank you, Nico. I, I, uh, I think that, you know, I, I really liked, um, what, what Ram did, you know, in Alley Town with the strays and when Selena was in a, a different part of Gotham. And I think that I wouldn't be telling the story I am now if he hadn't so successfully done that. Like, I think that what he did with Selena is, is, is really, really cool. Um, and like very necessary. And because of that work, I'm able to, um, kind of put her in a different, um, in a different place. And I think the, the big collision that I'm having a ton of fun with is that, for example, in a Batman story, usually you see him on the dark, wet streets with the middle of the night. And it's just, you know, he's at the docks and there's, you know, bad guys and they're punching each other and it's gritty. But when he puts on his suit and there's diamonds and champagne, then he's Bruce Wayne and he's not doing Batman stuff. And I think with Catwoman, it's like, I think she can work just fine in that environment. I think she can be her own kind of Batman within the world of champagne and diamonds and, and all of that. And she is not greedy because she can, she always knows she can have anything she wants. So she's not tempted by greed. Despite being a thief, she is not tempted by greed because she's so confident in her abilities as a thief. She can have anything she wants at any time. So, so why be grabby? With, with Selena, there is that kind of dichotomy that, like, she's one of the fanciest, like, most offensive femme fatale characters in the world. But then she's also, like, she's got these uh, grimy, scrappy, street thief aesthetics about her. Is that something you're looking to explore is, like, the dichotomy of those two different things that live inside? Totally. Totally. Like, and that's, um, that's something I really like relate to Selena about. That's something very like about her that I've always connected to, um, is that like, you know, I certainly, I, I have a wonderful family and did not have a childhood like Selena Kyle's. Um, but, uh, I, I did grow up kind of poor and, uh, things were kind of like, rough and I didn't ever have nice things as like a part, you know, a certain kind of nice thing as like a part of my life. And now as an adult woman, those are things I enjoy. I, I like champagne and designer bags and jewelry. Um, and I work very hard so that I can enjoy those things. Uh, and I, I think there's, that's like something about Selena that's always really important to me is like, you know, she's got that like started from the bottom mentality but she never ever loses touch of where she's from and um who the people are that are from there and and like she never loses that she's she and i think part of that is because she doesn't come up and see luxury and say oh yeah it's worth it to sacrifice my morals for that she looks at that and says i came up without that just fine and yeah i like it and yeah it's pretty now but i'll steal it when i want it i don't need to lie, cheat, and kill like you people do for greed. Like, you all do that because you don't know how to do what I do. I love that. Nico, with with you being able to kind of develop your own kind of chunk of Gotham, was there any particular architecture styles or cities that inspired your Gotham? Well, um, well, for me, Gotham was very important in this book. And I actually have been studying Gothic architecture, especially for the book, and how the Gothic like arch works and stuff, and why they were like how how was that revolution revolution and mm -hmm. like architect and stuff. Because for me, there is this place in Tokyo called Nihonbashi that is not like super famous, but the thing is, it really makes me remember to, to Gotham because it's a very old part of the city that the buildings were uh, made on the 30s. Because okay. to me also, Gotham makes me think a lot in the 30s. I'm not sure why, but I can see everything on the 30s. And, and well, this part of Tokyo are buildings that they were made on the 30s. They can still have like the bottom part but the top top part is like super new and shiny architecture full of windows and stuff and to me that's a gotham uh, like it's gotham in tokyo so i i went one time to take a lot of pictures for uh inspiration to for yeah to to me gotham is architecture for the 30s that a lot of stone on the mm -hmm. on buildings Plus uh, the arts from goth gothic architecture, 
plus new like luxury windows and stuff you put all together then you put some uh zeppelins on the air some like there is um it was the, some type, some kind of futurism architect that it was also a thing on the 30s but they were like envisioning cities from the future when they're put like a lot like, like everybody art was like trained hmm? like art deco art well a lot of art deco but in that time they visualized the future mm. since uh, from the point of view of art deco so if you search for those images they are so beautiful because there is a lot of things that they were not a thing in the moment. So they were thinking about huge bridge everywhere because they were thinking about just trains. Yeah. And it's just gorgeous. That I, I used a lot of that image for thinking about God's hand. That's so ex- It's like it's you've got the classic styles that have been built upon from the 30s and like you've got the futures in there too. That's so like the look of Gotham in this first issue is incredible. Everything we see it's is true. just like now, do you think there's anything that like thematically sets this part of the city apart from the other books? Like uh, Batgirls is kind of doing like that punk grittiness. Um, is there anything that sets yours apart aesthetically? I mean, in my mind, this is um, like this is where you go to spend money. Um, you know, this is less the part of town where. Um, the investment bankers work and more the part of town where the investment bankers play. The thing is, is the investment bankers have enough money that they're playing alongside people who like also have large amounts of money for potentially more questionable reasons um, or not. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the, this, you know, I, I won't, I won't spoil it for listeners, but I mean, you know, it, it, the Trixie is a really specific um, setup, you know, it, it's very much a, a, you know, a, a beautiful, polished, you know, den of villainy. <laughs> um, but it's also just home to um, a lot of women. Uh, it, it definitely, I was inspired um, by like the idea of it's the Gotham High Streets, that it's um, the wealthiest parts of town, which are not always the most and uh, nice crime, nicest, you know, most crime free parts of town. Um, I live in Los Angeles where, um, beautiful, beautiful, you know, very wealthy, um, houses and things are in areas that are, you know, often have crime because it's a city, city and people live Mm -hmm. to, people of different classes live together all in one space. And some people, uh, aren't cool about that. And, (laughs) but Selena is, um, (laughs) Selena's class aware. We love that about her. Um. Yeah, I, 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 this isn't, you know, like I was saying before, you know, I, I really love that, um, you know, Selena's a, a diamond in the rough, but she's also a diamond amongst other diamonds. Like, she hard. This, this just, this just came up as we're talking about this. Does DC have a map of Gotham? Like, are you given some sort of, this is the city? There's a, a lot of reference material that we're given, uh, at least uh, that we have access to, um, mm-hmm. which is really nice. And uh, some of it, and so like one of those things that I, I try to like explain in Big Two Comics is like, you know, um, like we often work with our editors to talk about stuff. So for example, if if the, on the official map of Gotham, there lacks something that I have in my head from like an old like grant issue. And I'm like, I really want to use this. The editor's probably not going to be like, no, it's not on the official yeah. map. So, you know, Gotham is a living place. Yeah. It's like the other living place I live and work, Krakoa. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I'm lucky enough to work in these like um, organism style cities and, and locations where, uh, um, like, yes, there are maps. They're ever changing. Yeah. They, they, they serve the story, not the other way around. We don't serve the map. And that's yeah. The story. Right. Right. Yeah, I've always heard that expression about the expansion. Like it's, it is what you need it to be. You can have whatever you want inside of it. Yep. Now, before I do want to ask some questions about, um, eco, but like before we get there with many titles, finally having queer representation on the page, was it important to you to bring back Selena's own queerness to the forefront? Yeah. 
it, it, it wasn't really um, an option for me. Um, Selena's bisexual. That's just, I'm bisexual. Um, it, uh, I and Selena, she's a character who I, I see a lot of myself in. Um, and I, I always see something of myself in every character I write. But this, this was a really special ask. And so um, I'm really grateful to work with editors who um, are aware and my, you know, my brilliant editor, our brilliant editor, Jess Chen is also a bisexual woman. And we're so, so proud to like work on this. And, and, um, there's another thing that happens when you get lucky enough to do work like this, which is, I don't feel the need because, um, So I think there are writers who, when they would write Selena, would be really worried because bisexual women can undergo a lot of pain and trauma and you don't want to be adding to that, right? But if you are someone who's been from that background and you do write uh, struggles, um, there's an element of like truth that you can put in it that can prevent it from feeling exploitative. And that's so exciting. <laughs> it's so freeing to write complicated things um, from your own truth. And that's what I get to do with her. Um, and that's why I'm so happy to write about her queerness. Like, yes, it's fun to write her kissing beautiful women and beautiful men, but it's also important to have that be there as who she is um, and how it affects her. Because it's not just about, you know, letting her hook up with a different guy or girl every issue. It's about her mentality. And as a character who works in desire and want, and um, that is her her weapon in so many ways to just, like, negate a huge part of her own desire. Um, it just feels like, you know, putting a blindfold on her for no reason. So... With the, uh, tell me if I mispronounce this, the Hasegawa family, is that, how do you pronounce it? Nico, you have more experience with yeah. the Japanese language than I do. You said it was, it's Hashigawa, correct? But it's... Yeah, it would be Hashigawa. Hashigawa. Okay. So, um, we've seen a few of the different members of that family, like the different, um, I don't know if they're the gang members, but they have the different colors and things like that. Nico, they have a very bright and very stylized look what were some of the inspirations that you took to design them well i wanted to give all the different families like very like uh a very distinctive look so my idea was like if you see one of the bad guys related like to different families you will realize from what family they are from and from the hasigawa family i really like it to put like some sort of harajuku style to it and but at the same time i like it the idea to use masks i don't know why i i love masks on bad guys cool. yeah super cool and so i wanted to use like uh this like harajuku new kind of fashion style but you use mask from japan's past like you have like tengu mask and so i kind of like the idea and but what we saw was actually like a super quick drawing that it was a, this is my idea. Da, 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 da. <laughs> what do you think about? But yeah, we will see more of that. I'm excited. I'm to very see your, excited. Your final. And with that, we also have Black Mask um, in the mix. Have you taken any inspiration from his movie looks rather than his past comic looks? Because I, I would much rather see you draw the movie one because like those outfits were unbelievable. Yeah, well, for me, actually, neither. It's because, as I was telling, I really like the fashion of the 30s. And okay. I think if uh, Black Mask will dress a suit, but not like a, I know, he will dress a suit. Like, I don't know if you know what it means. Like, it he yeah. really, like, he knows, like, what will go good, like, the real, the, the good, um, you know, I don't know how to the say sleeve, that. The sleeve placement? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, everything will be on, on like, 
perfect. There is a lot of like fashion going on on this book. I love that. And I think a lot of characters will pay attention to that detail. It's not just a pant. It will be the pant with the correct cut, with the correct size, like all of that. I like, like even like the details, how you will put your, your, I don't know the name of this in English, the cuff. Cufflinks? Cuff French cuff. Yeah. French. Those. Yeah. In English, we call them so, French cuffs. Oh. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And if you will have like a, a zoom there, it will have some sort of meaning. It will not be just a circle. I'm so excited. I'm yeah, it's incredible. Um, I am like a really, I'm, I, I love fashion and costuming. Um, I used to be a cosplayer. I, if I hadn't gone into writing um, and I'd gone into another creative field, I almost certainly would have been costuming and fashion. Uh, and it's still something I have a huge passion for. And it's part of why I love working with Nico because he's so good at, um, not only like, like when we do references, it's not just me dumping references and him being like, okay, like he, he's like, well, here were my ideas. And like, we see like, okay, well, what's kind of the shared element that we both want. And like, usually when we figure that out, we're both really excited. And we're like, and Jess is too, we're all excited. And Jordy, and we're all both the Jesses are all like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was like, <laughs> let's do this. Um, there's a Nico, your eye for fashion is just so impeccable. I wanted to say back when you were talking about um the like Hashigawa guys, like a big part of uh wanting to bring in Eiko and her family is that you know, because Nico lives in Japan and had such amazing like uh access to draw like parts of the city and just the so much inspiration to bring in and then um the the fashion work he, he does there's a there's a moment in the first issue where you know we, we see selena looking fabulous in this beautiful coat and sunglasses and she has a bag and it's a gorgeous bag and she, both the editors though both the jesses jess burby and jess chan are editors and i lost our minds because we were like men never remember to draw a bag it's like, <laughs> like male artists never remember that, like, if you're putting together an outfit, you take a bag, too. Like, it's a thing women do. We take a bag with our outfit. Um, not everyone, but it, it's something that makes an outfit look very complete and very thought out. Um, and Nico just gave her this beautiful bag. And we were all like, Nico's the best. (laughs) You just fully realize everything you do. You think about what it's doing and who put it on and what it's there for and who built it and why. And it's just such a treasure. I love working with you, Matt. (laughs) I love it. Thank you. I love working with you too. (laughs) So as I said at the top of the show, like I have some of these questions that like, I want to like ask you stuff that people haven't asked you before, but like this one, I just need to cut straight to the chase. Um, No elegancy here. Nico, was it important to you to make every single character in this book so goddamn beautiful? (laughs) Well, yeah, I not what I'm not looking for make them beautiful, okay? I, I what <laughs> I really like is to try to make them look real. Mm-hmm. And that when you see quite, and also that's a thing that I'm super grateful of teen, teeny scripts that when I need to draw a character, the character already feel real. The character has different layers of personality and I'm getting a person yeah. from the script. So I just only need to like make some like I already see it in my in my head when I'm reading the script. So that I'm super grateful for. So even though it is the drawing, it's it's not just me. It's the script that Tini gave me, all the description I got is already a person, so I can get to draw it. I, I don't feel like I'm drawing, I don't know, like a cartoony person or mm-hmm. like a very 2D person. Everybody have a profume uh like uh three-dimensional dt to their personality and that's why i can come with different details like if they were have like a very plain personality i will not see those details in my mind i i also just really love um and you'll see in upcoming issues um like nico is also an artist who's really good at understanding um that drawing you know, beautiful, impressive characters comes with a lot of, of diversity in the literal sense of how, you know, humans have a lot of sliders. <laughs> if you were making a character in a video game, there's a lot of different ways humans can be and look. Um, and a lot of them are, are 
very beautiful. And a lot of comic artists only draw a few body types or a few face types or a few, um, you know, types of people. And Nico is so good at drawing beautiful people of all shapes and sizes and body types. And he's always thinking of it. Like one thing I love Nico is when you're like, how do we make this character silhouette different from every other? And it's so smart because Gotham is a shadowy place and people appear in silhouette often. And Batman is such a clear silhouette, you know, and we're always thinking of that in comics. Um, and even in this book, and it, it, it makes it feel so much more alive to write when I'm imagining these people and they're not just five shapes that are all the same Ken and Barbie shapes. It's, you know, we, we go back and forth giving each other details that make the characters more and more real. I'm that, That's so exciting to me because I love to see everyone doesn't have to be the same height or things like that. I was looking, I don't want to spoil anything, but Finbar was such a beautiful design. I was like, that doesn't look like anybody else like in these pages. Like it's so interesting to see the diversity amongst the characters. Um, now, with the book, we're seeing Iko, Iko Hashigawa. Um, since it's, the fir- it's the first time, I say Eiko. Eiko? I think it pronounced Eiko? It pronounced in Japanese Eiko, but I might be I don't I might be wrong. Nico might know better than I do. I th- yeah, it's very similar. I think it will be Eiko. Eiko. Yeah, Eiko. Yeah. Listen, you're the team. You decide. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Eiko hasn't been seen since the end of uh, Genevieve Valentine's run, but was a like a vital figure during that period. How do you think she's changed since then? Like, what are her thoughts on Selena since they've last met? Um, I don't want to spoil Without, that too much because yeah. they, they have like a pretty concise conversation about it in the first issue that um, I'm really proud of. <laughs> I think it makes the point better than I could hear. Um, but. Uh, Aiko's presence in the city brings up a lot in her, the kind of power that Aiko has achieved in the city and the kind of power that Selena wants in the city. Um, they make really, really good characters to have discussions about um, how to be a woman and survive in Gotham, how to be a woman with any power and survive uh, in a very dangerous place. And um they have also this really interesting thrum of kind of intimate, sexy, will they or won't they distrust between them, uh, which is hot. And my favorite thing in comics is when <laughs> two characters can sit and have a talk about a mission or a deal or something, but they're both hot and kind of into each other. And we all know it. Um and Eiko is just like one of the many wonderful ways I get to do that with Selena. I'm so grateful for that character. I'm so grateful for that run. Um, I had to bring her back. Yeah. That um the conversation that you mentioned is like it feels like the first time that I've seen two characters of the former relationship have a real interaction, like a real human, like this is how it would have played out. It was beautiful. Thank you. Um Nico drew so the with- hell out of it. I want that boat. <laughs> yeah. With that, um, you mentioned the tension between these two former lovers. Um, how do you write that versus a recently rekindled love of Shatterstar and Richter? I couldn't leave them out. Yeah. Uh, no, I love them. They're very important to me. Um, I have been deeply in love with my husband for like 12 years. Um, and I'm still really, really wildly in love with him. We're like best friends. Um, so I've been really, really lucky to be in deep, deep love. And in my life earlier times before I met him, I had some loves and losses. Um, but I've been someone who in my life has just been incredibly lucky to have a lot of experience with, um, getting to know people and with, with being in love. I'm very, I'm very lucky in that part of my life. So uh, it's compelling and fun and exciting for me to write about. Um, you know, it's really just the, the search for companionship and what you're doing is you're just taking two characters and, and putting that um, light on or off, you know? And um, I love just thinking about these two people if you can just take the spark of the knowledge that they want each other and and not think about why, and then put them in a room together and let yourself as the writer come to reasons why, right? Like, um, we all know Rogue loves Gambit, but 
part of why Rogue loves Gambit is because he knows how she likes her eggs and he listens when she says she doesn't want to have kids. Like, those, we all know that he would do that for her, but um, I really thrive on taking moments of, like, real awkwardness or real challenge um, because I don't think love stories are, are we meet, we kiss, we fight, then we kiss again, then we do it, then we get married, then we have babies. I just don't think that's how love stories go. So I don't mm-hmm. uh, write them that way. Um, but to answer your question, it's it's wonderful. I really, I like romance. I'm glad Nico does too. <laughs> yeah. so, I have two uh, questions, one for each of you before we get to our grand finale. Nico, with Catwoman's iconic weapon being this whip, what kind of strengths do you find in that as an artist? Like, does it get, allow you to express differently than, a, like, a sword? Um, well, it's a very good question, because fighting with a whip, it, I don't know, it's, it's hard. Like, I, I have been watching a lot of videos to try to picture how she will move, how she will mm-hmm. use it. But the things with a whip is, like, if she really use it to attack, it's like a long range weapon. So that makes things complicated for me because I feel like, I, I don't know, it will depend on the scene. Like the fight scenes we have uh, for the, like we have our, I, I, it needed more close contact. Mm-hmm. So even at first, we also were very thinking about long range weapons. But I need to take that off to be able to put the characters very close together. Mm-hmm. So we are using the whip in different ways. And I love the way we're using it, but it's not like an up for attack weapon mm-hmm. that also will be super cool, but it's not for our story yet. That. I like but that. I I really love like also like the possibilities it keeps like the whip because also like for when we have traveling sequence that she can use the whip like for I'm very bad on these words in English swinging but to, yeah yeah there is um <clears throat> there is a silhouette in issue one that's gonna blow people's minds like as soon as I saw it I was like I want to I want to find this page and I want to buy it because it's so <laughs> beautiful. The use of the whip is just like incredible. Um, now, in other interviews, you've talked about um, like the mob, the crime families and things like that. But something I, I found very interesting was the focus on the female characters in those medias. Do you have any favorite characters from different mafia media? Um, the women, Like what woman was your favorite? And how do you approach writing a character like that? That's definitely... Uh, it, it, inspired like i the thing i i uh, one of the things i first brought up to, to jess when i brought up was i was like um i'm a huge huge scorsese fangirl um and uh i really i really always love the the women in his movies even though i often tend to come away feeling like they're the best characters but that obviously it's like that's that's who i wanted more of, like you know karen from goodfellas um i mean lorraine brocco is just a goddess um to you know uh uh sharon stone and casino like is kind of the um kind of i mean obviously she'd be like she isn't she goes on a bad path uh one that we wouldn't really see selena go down quite that same kind of path but um you know she's a woman who you don't realize until later that like she's not just a blonde bimbo she's you know working she has her own hustle and she's got her own plans um and the fact, I, I don't know, I was really, I was really inspired by that. The, the kind of, I specifically, it's like the, the, the Karens, the, you know, the Sharon Stone and Goodfellas, or excuse me, in Casino, um, the, the women who are often written off and, and, and viewed as just like, oh, they just show up when they want money. Um, it's like, no, these are, these are people with fully realized lives and you have forgotten that and you are going to pay for it. I love that. I am. I'm so excited for people to read the first issue. Um, So, again, as I said, we're pretty hard hitting journalists. Like, really, to end with a big one. If you had a Rube Goldberg machine in your life, what would it do and how? Probably when I finished a script and hit send. 
it would like flip all it would like take a little train that would take all my laundry down to the laundry room and then it would like <laughs> flip me into the shower and turn it on and like cook me a little meal so then I could like come out of the shower post deadline with like laundry and like a plate of pasta um ding that's what I want how it does that I'll <laughs> leave that to the engineers that's for the artist <laughs> <laughs> I just have to write the words <laughs> Uh, well, I think for me it would be the, like a machine that takes me out of the bed and sits me in front of the computer <laughs> and put me the pencil on my hand and a tap in my shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> a machine that reconfirmed you. You're doing a great job. Yeah. I broke my espresso machine this morning, I think. So maybe that's what my Rube Goldberg machine needs to do. Oof. So thank you both for being here. Um, Catwoman thank 39 will be out on January 18th. That's correct. Correct. Um, do you have any other projects you um, people should be picking up? Um, I would love for people to follow me on Substack at teenyhoward.substack.com. You can just go to teenyhoward.com and there's a little place you can put in your email and sign up for my newsletter. And I post there about updates on Catwoman, on Knights of X, on my little one shots like Bloodstone and Secret X-Men and also on upcoming projects of my own that I've got coming up this year. So um, I don't use Twitter or anything. So if you follow me there, you won't get any updates. But if you follow me on my newsletter, you will. So go do that. For me, if people will follow me on my Instagram, I will be happy. I don't have any followers. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but I, I never actualize it, so it's my fault. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you both so much for being here. This is a great time. You can find us at gatecrashers.fan and on all social media at gatecrashers.pod. Stupid, I'm